9-11 time period and the post 9-11 time period is to talk, if you could tell us what the date of the first book was, the, the second and, and obviously 2017 is the third, and why was it necessary to have a new edition mm -hmm. when in 2006 and then and again now in 2017 because that I think allows us to get a time frame for how things have changed. Sure. Well. Firstly, thank you very much for doing this and yeah, taking pleasure. time out of your own busy schedule. Peter actually has a new documentary that's going to be released next week, Legion of Brothers, which I highly recommend. Unfortunately, I have to teach that night, so I'm going to miss the premiere. Um, and thank you all for coming, and especially students in my 546 class who are enduring two nights in a row of uh, terrorism discussion. So this, this book uh, first emerged on a very dreary afternoon in November 1996 in St. Andrews, Scotland, where a very old friend of mine, uh, who was then my editor, we've just become very good friends, suggested the idea of a comprehensive book that would cover all aspects of, or as many aspects as possible, on uh, terrorism. And uh, it was initially published in the United Kingdom uh, by a, a commercial press. And here there's an interesting similarity with the first time that we met, which was 16 years ago in a bit. So Peter and I first met on September 1st, 2001. If you mm -hmm. might remember, we had lunch at the Army-Navy Club. And we met because you had written an article about the threat that Osama bin Laden posed that had been rejected by foreign affairs, foreign <laughs> policy, the national interest. Every publication, and you asked if I was perhaps interested in publishing the journal that I edited, Studies in Conflict and Terrorism. And with the enormous prescience that I had, um, I published it. It came out October 1st, 2001. But of course, your life was transformed just a few weeks later, and Holy, uh, Holy yeah. War, Inc. Uh, came out. Um, this book, three years earlier, had a similar trajectory in one sense. It, had, it was published in, uh, at th that stage in nine countries. Um, it had been denounced in the Duma in Moscow by Vladimir Putin as encouraging <laughs> and supporting terrorism. You should have used that as a blurb. <laughs> it was praised, on the other hand, in the, in the Serb parliament by Slobodan Milosevic. Oh. <laughs> and he especially cited, the, it, the first edition only had eight chapters, but he cited the ninth chapter, which was on the Kosovo Liberation Army, which I never wrote. Apparently, I had a Serbian co-author that I never heard of and never got any royalties from. But the point of the similarity is that in my callowness as a young man back then. I was desperate to get it published by a commercial press in the United States, like Knopf, who published uh, uh, my previous book, because I wanted to make money, frankly. And it was turned down, the manuscript was turned down by every major publisher in the United States. So no one wanted to publish Inside Terrorism. And literally, almost in desperation, I turned to an old friend of mine who was a, still is a professor at Columbia University. He was on the Columbia University uh, advisory board to their press. Mm. And he said, well, what about Columbia? And I thought, well, it was prestigious enough, also beggars. I had no place else to turn to. Mm. And if it wasn't for that, I would have never gotten the job at Georgetown because, of course, to, be, to get tenure and to be, mm. in my case, to be appointed to professorial level, you had to have two university press books. So mm. the first edition was one, and then the second edition, I added 70,000 words, and the first edition was 90,000 words. So I practically had written a new book. Very kindly, Georgetown counted that as two books, and that's how I ended up here. So, <laughs> lest any of you believe fate doesn't play an enormous role in life, and not to be discouraged, and Peter and I are two, you know, classic examples. Peter even even more so. So, the genesis of the first book was my argument that terrorism was fundamentally changing, that new actors with different motivations, different rationales were emerging, that would change the face of terrorism and make it far more lethal and far more consequential than it had ever been before. And in the years leading up to 9-11, that wasn't a very popular view. In fact, in the academic community, I wouldn't say I was laughed at, but I was assailed by most of my peers who found the book uh, unnecessarily alarmist. Um, I was accused of searching for new enemies with the end of the Cold War. Uh, and the book, basically, as I wrote it, was meant to be, provide something of a history of terrorism from almost from antiquity to 9-11 in essence. I mean, I finished it um, a few months before, well, it was published rather, just a few months before the, uh, the August 1998 embassy bombings. So that was the first edition. Uh, of course, immediately after the 9-11 attacks, 
Columbia wanted me to publish a second edition. I didn't think enough really had changed in terrorism that the book was meant to be a broad overview. So I didn't think that even as seismic event as 9-11 necessarily warranted another edition. And it wasn't until 2005 that I wrote the second edition that was published in 2006. And there were three things that really, I think, were the, were the, the genesis of, of the second edition. It was what had once been a very peripheral terrorist tactic, suicide terrorism, had moved to the center and was far more prominent. In fact, was the preferred t tactic of terrorists throughout the world, not least as exemplified on 9-11-2001. On and then, of course, US, the US military's involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq, and especially the frustrations with counterinsurgency, and trying to parse whether it was terrorism, whether it was counterinsurgency, whether it was guerrilla warfare, mm -hmm. All those things necessitated a second edition. And then the third edition arose, I mean, it was really three things. The emergence of ISIS, which almost no one had predicted, and I think in just a few short years has really changed the nature of terrorism, not least because of their harnessing of social media, for example. So this was a very important element. By the second edition, I had two chapters on the media and communications. I had, the initial edition had a long disquisition on the media and media's relationship with terrorism by the second edition. I called that the old media, which was the traditional TV, newspaper, and radio, and had to already have a different chapter that dealt with the internet. So for the third edition, there was not now a third edition, a third chapter on the media, but an expanded discussion of uh, Al-Qaeda's harnessing, I'm sorry, ISIS's harnessing of social media, encrypted media. And then there was the other element, which I wrote about this weekend in, in the Wall Street Journal, Al-Qaeda's stubborn resilience 16 years into the struggle, mm -hmm. I think, demanded some examination. And all that plays into the final chapters of the new edition. So um, ISIS is uh, on the road to defeat and um, lost Mosul and mostly lost Raqqa. <clears throat> but it seems that to me that, uh, that ISIS is a symptom of other problems. It, it, of course, it creates problems. But it, you know, so if, if you accept that there are some real big problems that ISIS is a symptom of you know, the marginalization of, of uh, Sunni by Shia and various Middle Eastern countries, collapse of Arab governance, Arab economies, uh, you know, Muslim immigration into Europe and unprecedented scale, et cetera. So what do you, 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 you wrote about the resilience of Al Qaeda. Uh, will the, do you think there will be other permutations of ISIS? Will Al Qaeda uh, merge with a rump ISIS or like, you know, what do you see all the possibilities. ISIS, I think, in one way or another, is here to stay. I mean, it's fun, as I said a moment ago, it's changed the nature of terrorism. So astonishingly, in such a short period of time, I don't think it's going to be a flash in the pan. Now, it's not mm. going to be the Islamic State, and it's not going to be the proto-state that it was, but I think it will revert to its DNA going back to the time of Abu Musab al-Zarqawi and engage in terrorism. Yeah. And I think much as Al-Qaeda ensured its own longevity by cultivating branches and franchises, ISIS has done the same thing. Yeah. And according to the NCTC, they have at least 18 branches uh, across North Africa, the Middle East, increasingly South Asia, Southeast Asia. So much like the branches kept out and franchises kept Al-Qaeda in business, I think for the time being, it will also keep ISIS in business. What does that mean for American national security? Clearly, that's a bad thing for the countries that these affiliates exist in, but what is that capacity really to attack the United States? <sighs> to attack U.S. targets overseas, I think their external operations capability certainly has that potential. Yeah. To threaten commercial aviation, this is not an issue that we've necessarily yeah. had to wrestle with uh, in the decade after 9-11. I mean, mm. That was, I think, one of the success stories, but that slowly eroded over the past few years and certainly the technological capabilities that were once the domain of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and Ibrahim al-Asiri have spread further afield. Uh, I suppose if there is any good news that ISIS has never been able to build up the network in the United States that it has in Europe, and of course the number of foreign fighters from the United States has been relatively modest compared to some of our closest European allies. What do you, so you mentioned the kind of ISIS um, advances in making bombs that are hard to kind of detect that could be put on a plane. And uh, what did you make of DHS when it uh, banned, when it, when it uh, basically took kind of measures, uh, 
from I think about eight Middle East and North African countries yeah. where you couldn't bring personal computers in, into the plane, but you could put them in the hold. And what did you make of all that? And yeah, unfortunately, I think it's a disaster or a tragedy waiting to happen because I think the capabilities of terrorists yeah. to conceal in, in um, personal devices has, you know, basically 20 years ago, Ramzi Ahmed Youssef pioneered the use of lithium batteries mm. uh, to, to power explosives and, of course, blew a hole in the side of a Japanese aircraft, uh, and killed a Japanese student. That technology has not been forgotten, I think, is now being harnessed and yeah. poses a serious threat. I mean, you have, you know, the B or the C team like Al-Shabaab getting a bomb in a computer on board into Alo aircraft. Yeah. Now, Mogadishu doesn't have the same security that Dulles does. But nonetheless, for both groups, they haven't forgotten the desire, uh, well, haven't forgotten that the impact of aviation terrorism, for their point of view, pays vast dividends. And then I think in June, DHS said, um, I think there are 280 airports that have direct flights in the United States at some point. I mean, some, some may only have you know, relatively infrequent flights, but that there would be additional measures, you know, more dogs, uh, some, some measures that may not be immediately obvious, better screening of passengers. I mean, that all seems like a very good idea. Uh, but is that uh, enough or is it, um, you know, we're just kind of waiting for the inevitable and in a way, if it's, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's a US bound plane, obviously that's mm -hmm. better for the terrorists, but if they can demonstrate, hey, we blew up a BA flight, mm -hmm. you know, that, that does the trick for them. Well, two things. One goes back 11 years ago to the airline's plot from Heathrow Airport by yeah. jihadis associated with Al-Qaeda. Uh, I mean, they chose one of the toughest airports. I mean, London yeah. Heathrow has always had especially good airport security going back to the 1980s. Uh, and they weren't deterred by it. And I think that's alarming. So I don't think it's, it's, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's something that's you know, foretold that it will happen, but I think that Terrorists are always trying to stay one st step ahead of the counterterrorist technology curve and always yeah. trying, to, which is a line actually from Inside Terrorism, um, <laughs> always trying to obviate or overcome the defenses. I think there's also a defenses. shark in there. This, that's, that's right, the terrorists are like the archetypal shark in the water that have to constantly move forward or die. Um, so in that sense, from the terrorist point of view, commercial aviation is the most lucrative target set. You kill yeah. a lot of people, but in their conceit and hubris, they believe they can throttle our economy. And that's exactly what bin Laden decreed as Al-Qaeda's strategy. It was a war of attrition. It was to economically bankrupt their opponents. And I think to an extent ISIS has also adopted that. Yeah, but isn't that kind of naive? I mean, the 9-11 attacks cost $500 billion to our economy. At the time, it was $14 trillion. So that's 4%, which is you know, not insignificant. But I mean, these, these people aren't really economists. And uh, no. they... they, they, they um, I mean, they, they have this narrative that we're going to be bled dry and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, in, in, during the Vietnam War, we spent, I think, at, at one point, 12 percent of GDP on our armed forces during World War II, 40 percent. So the, the, I think they've tried, I, I guess, the, the, what, there's a question here about, we seem to have made a mistake, which is, ex and I'm not including you or anybody in this room <laughs> in making this mistake, but ascribing to them uh, kind of smarter motivations, sometimes which they have put yeah. out there, uh, than is actually the case. Because it's, uh, you know, a very common view is, hey, we got sucked into Afghanistan and Iraq and blah, 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 by the, the devilish, you know, Osama bin Laden. But I mean, certainly that is not what he intended for the yeah. Taliban to be overthrown. So, so what, uh, I guess this gets to a question about what are their, what do they really want? Which is a question that, uh, you know, was a question we asked after 9-11 a lot. Well, I think fortunately in their conceit, they believe their own propaganda. Yeah. Propaganda doesn't have to be true, and you're absolutely yeah. right. It just has to be believed by them, and it just has to be peddled in an effective enough way that they can attract recruits and supporters, but also maintain the internal cohesion to sustain their struggle. But that's exactly the mistakes that terrorists make, is that they, yeah. they live in this fantasy world where they are omnipotent, but the reality is they're not. Well, you wrote uh, a, a brilliant book about a case where terrorists actually succeeded, which is in Israel against the British. Right. But is that, a, is that an outlier or is that, um, I mean, terrorism as a tactic uh, is usually ineffective? Or, or, and, and if that's the case, where, where has it worked well? Well, 
it's more effective than I think victim, it's victims and governments claim that firstly, on a tactical basis, it does terrorize us. It yeah. does have demonstrable effects in our spending, sometimes in our travel plans, um, certainly creating political po profound polarization in societies, yeah. undermining confidence in leadership. So terrorism is not ineffectual as much as we want to say. The question is, does it ever achieve the terrorist long-term goals? Right. There, fortunately, the historical record is, you know, is, is, is benign in the sense it doesn't. And so but give us they still believe that they can, that they, if they shoulder on, if they soldier on, they can replicate this. So with what are the like, top three cases where it actually succeeded? Well, certainly I think it played, well, in the post-colonial era, it played a, a pivotal role in the creation of Israel and the creation of Algiers, certainly. Yeah. Uh, liberation of Cyprus and the creation of the Greek Cypriot state, the Archbishop Makarios was the leader of the above ground forces. Um, so the successes, I think, are clearly there in elevating the status of the Palestinian yeah. Palestinian uh, Palestine Liberation Getting Organization. The British out of Northern Ireland. Yeah. Well, and this, I think, is where we get into issues in contemporary times. It's perhaps more pernicious of corrosive than we admit. I mean, Hezbollah controls Lebanon um, and has been able to transition from what was once very clearly a terrorist group to something that now is not quite a terrorist group that still has terrorist capabilities, but runs Lebanon, is able to intervene fairly effectively in propping up the Assad regime, has waged war quite effectively against a nation state, takes credit for getting Israel to withdraw from South Lebanon in 2000, um, certainly gave Israel more than a bloody nose in the 2006 Lebanon war. Um, and then of course, the case of the IRA, I mean Sinn Féin, uh, it maybe isn't the most popular political party in Northern Ireland, because Northern Ireland still has a Protestant majority, but amongst the Catholic community. In fact, in the last elections, it got one less seat than the DUP, and it got it tripled the number of seats that the Social Democratic and Labour Party, John Hume's party, had gotten. John Hume was a Nobel laureate. A very moderate party uh, was completely eclipsed by Sinn Féin, which of course was the above-ground political arm of the IRA. But isn't, isn't that kind of better, I mean, to some degree, you know, if, if these terrorist groups then evolve into people that engage in kind of normal politics, is, is that, that's kind of a good thing, right? It is kind of a good thing, but it shows that terrorist wor terrorism works in the sense they would have never had the political viability of the power that they acquired to make that transition. And what's chilling yeah. in the case of something you know so much about with Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda is that he actually studied the case of the Irgun and Menachem Begin and had those books in Al-Qaeda's library in Kandahar. Mm -hmm. Not to learn terrorist techniques, but exactly to study that transition from an underground movement to a bona fide, bona fide political party, which is kind of chilling when you think about it in the Al-Qaeda context. So how would you describe Hezbollah, which is, you know, in, in, members of parliament in Lebanon and has an army that is conducting conventional warfare and has a terrorist sort of, what, what, what is that? And is that kind of just a, uh, kind of what the Islamic State could have been if it was less violent and kind of a little bit more, you know, it was a little smarter in its tactics. Well, the Islamic State goes back to your point that, you know, terrorists often sow, sow the seeds of their own undoing because yeah. of their, despite their hubris, their complete inability to predict responses to their, to their violence and often overstepping their boundaries and, and, and provoking a response that they can't survive. Uh, my view, Hezbollah is an embryonic version of Iran from the time of the Iranian Revolution. Iran always embraced state-sponsored terrorism as an instrument of its foreign policy to be used when it suited them and when it could advance their goals and to be held in reserve when it didn't. I think Hezbollah operates on exactly, exactly the same principles. Has Hezbollah attacked an American target um, since the mid-'80s? Well, I would say yes in Iraq, because a lot of the Iraqi militias, uh, the Shia militias, were trained and backed by either Hezbollah or by the Revolutionary Guards. But overtly in an act of terrorism, no. But, but if they were attacking American soldiers, would that be an act of terrorism anyway? It depends on the context. Yeah. Um, you know, the Marine barracks bombing? But that was in 1983. No, but I'm just saying, but that yeah. blurs the distinction, because yeah. the Marines were sent there as peacekeepers. Right. Of course, right. they intervened in the Lebanese conflict, which sort of overshadow their peacekeeping role, but I still think they were, I mean, 
their weapon, they did not have ammunition chambered in their weapons. They still saw themselves as not in a state of war. So that's right. terrorism, as the USS Cole attack would be. Right. I guess what I'm getting at a little bit is the Trump administration often talks about Iranian terrorism, and I'm, I'm often a little puzzled by the claim because I, I, I get that they do things that, mm. um, you know, honor the interests of lots of people. Uh, but terrorism in the way that Al Qaeda conducts itself or ISIS uh, seems mm. a lot clearer than what a Hezbollah does. By design, because you know, it's, it's Hezbollah's terrorism was always a form of, it was always a, in a, basically an Iranian cat's paw when mm -hmm. Iran needed uh, them to respond. Um, certainly a lot of the subversion that occurs amongst Shia communities in the Gulf is backed by Hezbollah, the Revolutionary Guards, but you're right, it's not actually Hezbollah operatives necessarily blowing things up as much supplying, encouraging, and facilitating locals doing so. But I think that's the difference between a non-state terrorist group and then a state that uses terrorism because they're going to embrace terrorism for its clandestine and concealment qualities that it can mask who's actually involved in it. And for Hezbollah, I think overtly being involved in terrorist acts would be detrimental to its image. But certainly supporting terrorism is still very much, I think, a daily activity. After the death of bin Laden and the Arab Spring, um, were you kind of optimistic that the terrorism problem would recede, or did you foresee that there would be vacuums that would be created by right. uh, revolutions in the Middle East? No, I was always a, a skeptic that the Arab Spring w would achieve the transformative power in the Middle East that some people believed it would. I thought that. Uh, Firstly, the fact that so many jihadis were freed from prisons across North Africa and the Middle East would yeah. be used to refuel and regenerate those, those movements. Um, but I also feared, and I think this is exactly what happened, is that terrorist groups by definition are revolutionary. I mean, they're all about change, and therefore they have to be able to pivot and to adjust to even crises like the death of their founder and leader, but also political challenges like the Arab Spring in order to survive. And they were much faster in some respects, especially seizing on the Syrian civil war as precisely the kind of cause and opportunity to rejuvenate themselves. So are you um, optimistic now, pessimistic, somewhere in between? What is your, I mean, you, you wrote, well, you've written about, <laughs> I mean, Bruce and I have had this conversation for many years. And I'm by nature an optimist, and right. I think Bruce by nature is a pessimist in, in, this, I, in this area. Right. Well, uh, you know, I often think of, of, of my old friend Walter LeCur, who's of course is 96 now, is a Holocaust survivor, and he said that only the pessimists survived the Holocaust because the optimists always thought Hitler would be brought under control, uh, that things would get yeah. better. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the case with me, but having studied terrorism now for 41 years and seen how yeah. it's become a more intractable and worse international problem than it was when I started, doesn't leave me with a wellspring of optimism. Yeah. And then just the simple fact that, we may disagree on this as well, but I think Al-Qaeda is as dangerous as it was 16 years ago, perhaps not in terms of attacking the United States as it did on 9-11, but certainly in having cultivated an international presence, um, secondly, in having entrenched itself in a number of different countries, and the fact that we're confronted on the 16th anniversary, you know, facing two terrorist movements with their associated branches and franchises. I don't know if it makes me pessimistic, but by nature I'm a worrier, so yeah. I certainly worry. You know, Maggie Thatcher famously said in 1985 that if you deprive terrorists of the oxygen of publicity, uh, that, you know, this would be a very good thing, because that's what they've, so, but now that seems like a very quaint notion. I mean, you've written a lot about this, so, uh, it looks like the terrorists and the and, and media have sort of merged together, right? That they kind of control their own media, they can bypass conventional. So, how, how has that changed um, the kind of terrorist landscape? Does it make them more powerful? Is it? Oh, is it? Mm. No, that's a that's a good question. I think it definitely makes them more powerful because it's given them basically the power to shape their own destiny, and that's exactly one of the key innovations from ISIS that I think Al-Qaeda now is emulating as well as this use of social media as a vehicle yeah. for radical, not just radicalization and recruitment, but 
as a way to marshal an array of different threats against their enemies, from lone wolves, from the professional terrorists, or from this hybrid in between enabled terrorists that are lone wolves, but receive very specific targeted instruction or receive uh, intelligence to facilitate attacks. It's interesting, I think, that um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula actually, we think of ISIS as doing a lot of the innovation, but if you look at like Inspire Magazine or you know, putting out a really slick internet publication in colloquial English and kind of basically trying to inspire people in the West. I mean, this is really a blueprint that Al-Qaeda in, in, in yeah, Yemen yeah. kind of started that ISIS may have learned from, I think. No, exactly. And I think that's the problem is for terrorist groups to function in the 21st century. To use a cliche, they have to be learning organizations, but they have to learn from one another and they have to learn from their own mistakes and their own successes. And you see ISIS having replicated the success of Anwar al awlaki yeah. not just Inspire Magazine, but also his, you know, his, his media presence on the internet, but also on YouTube. And you see Al-Qaeda having really, I think, lost momentum and being taken quite a bit by surprise by the, by the harnessing of social media that ISIS was able to occur, moving more into that realm as well now. We're in the bioethics library. Are you concerned about um bioterrorism, is there a sort of Moore's law of, of, of bio, biology that's going on that could make it easier for a biological attack? And why is it that we haven't seen you know, terrorists really succeed in using anything right. other than crude chemical weapons? Well, going back to your, your quote from Margaret Thatcher in 1984 when she said, publicity is the oxygen the terrorists depend on. I think that was a very cold war formulation, it suited the time. Mm. If I were rephrasing that in 2017, I would say that access to sanctuary and safe haven is the oxygen upon which terrorism depends mm. now um, as, as, a, as a sign shore, as a focus of recruitment, but also for training camps, also to provide direction, also mm. to generate publicity. Uh, but the other aspect of sanctuary and safe haven that's so dangerous is that it gives terrorists the scope to engage in research and development of unconventional weapons. And certainly, as much as the WMD in Iraq was a huge mistake and was a profound intelligence failure, it wasn't that wasn't the case with Al Qaeda in Afghanistan before 9/11, where they had multiple programs in chemical, biological, radiological, even nuclear ambitions that fortunately were not even in the quarter baked realm, but were still, <laughs> from their point of view, seriously pursued. Today, I think once again, just the movement of people access to information has, and the recruitment patterns of terrorism. Now, you wrote about this some years ago when you described how the 25 people that had had a, you know, a direct role in the 9-11 attacks, I think it was at least half of them had bachelors, two of them were on their way to PhDs, several had MAs. And we see that progression now. And there's an excellent book that came out last year by Diego Gambetta and Stefan Hertog, Engineers mm -hmm. of Jihad. So when I first started studying terrorism as a young analyst at Rand in 1981, one of our first projects was this mapping the demography of terrorism. And uh, one of my favorite questions to my classes, but I'm giving the answer away so I can't use this anymore, was you know, what were the two most common vocations of terrorists in the 1970s? And they were teachers, and in and particular doctors. university professors and medical doctors, exactly. Today you find far as Gambetta and Hertog revealed, but as your study years ago did, far more engineers becoming involved in this, or far more people with scientific backgrounds. The but the interesting thing is, like Al Qaeda was sort of an elite organization, like Georgetown, and ISIS is like a non-elite organization, like yeah. the DC public school system, right? So, they, I mean, not to, I mean, yeah. I mean, basically that's the difference, right? And so there are there, there's value in both approaches, right. uh, uh, but ISIS doesn't care who he did. Yeah, I, you know, they have 60, 70,000 fighters have been killed. I'm sure mm -hmm. most of those people were not like, you know, engineers or doctors. No, but I think they, they were very selective in who they sent to the front lines and who was cannon fodder. Yeah. I think in the biological realm, the complexity of that, that's what drove Om Shinrikyo to use sarin nerve gas in 1995. For, they had a dozen attempts using biological weapons, mm. and none of them succeeded because it's very difficult to use. They turned to chemical weapons. I think that's exactly the ISIS pattern, just as you described, because they don't have the same skill set. But what worries me is groups like Al Qaeda, mm. with the sanctuary and safe haven, with this opportunity to recruit more selectively, probably are thinking along unconventional lines. I hate uh, to bring up the Sageman Hoffman debate, but I will. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, uh, the th I'm going to summarize the thesis and then we can talk about because like it's an interesting question was he eventually right or not really or and that basically uh, the real threat in the United States was from people who were not associated with terrorist groups in any formal sense they'd radicalized on the internet and that and that sort of seems more tr a lot more true today than it might have seemed mm -hmm. when the book was published and when you wrote about it on the other hand people who kind of radicalized in their bedroom and this is why I took, I'm in violent agreement with you you know, it's one thing to have uh, eight guys, nine guys train in an ISIS camp, uh, conduct you know, multiple attacks in Paris that kill 130 people, which they've been trained to do, mm -hmm. versus you know, somebody who radicalizes here, who is able to buy a semi-automatic weapon legally because it's easy to do that in this country, and kills, you know, as in San Bernardino, 14 people attending a, a, an office meeting. So. I mean, is, is was Sageman more right today, or is he, are you is he still wrong? Because at the end of the day, what does matter is safe haven and people being trained by a formal terrorist organization that is going to you know, have the money and the resources and the time to actually create people who can do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Well, he was, and I never said he was completely wrong either, yeah. because the radicalization factor was a very important one. I just felt that the, that the discussion back then was very, and you can see this actually in the New York Times article of August 13th, 2006 by Scott Shane, where when the, the 2006 airline plot that I described earlier was being discussed, there were any number of specialists who completely dismissed the possibility that Al-Qaeda could have been involved in it. Because they said Al-Qaeda had ceased to exist, that basically terrorist organizations no longer mattered, that the phenomena had become undeniably bottom up. And that was the main argument I felt in leaderless jihad. Yeah. And of course, I mean, none of these things are pure categories. It was always yeah. both. And, but certainly, you, always, you need an organization with an ideology that is the inspirational force behind the radicalization. And you can't deny that there weren't terrorist organizations with command and control structures like Al Qaeda even then that were still planning and plotting terrorist attacks. And I thought that, that the discussion then was, was, was too black and white and that yeah. it was more blended. And what about somebody like uh, the attacker in Charlottesville? How would you, what, how, what level of concern do you have about sort of far right extremism and also leftist mm -hmm. and black nationalist, which we're beginning to see coming back? Um, it's a much more serious problem than it's been in any years because these people feel much more empowered because they also harness social media, yeah. also engage in radicalization and recruitment. Uh, I think the main difference though is that terrorist organizations like Al Qaeda pose a far more cohesive and sustained threat, whereas there's a much more amorphous quality to these groups uh, that doesn't mean that they can't commit tragic acts of violence. Yeah. But it's a very different kind of threat. It's a much less cohesive one. Um, and it is one, you know, the old adage too is that if you believe that all the terrorism a decade ago was bottoms up and was individuals, then it was a police problem and law enforcement could solve it. Hmm. And I would argue that the threat from right and left in the United States that we've seen as a result of political polarization in this country is certainly amenable to law enforcement solutions. And the FBI over the past decades has proven enormously successful encountering these threats. Uh, the threats posed by Salafi jihadi groups, though, I mean, there's no police force in the world that can face up to them. I mean, it's not to say that, and that's another mistake we made a decade ago. <laughs> there are even some armies who can't face up to them, it turns Well, precisely. Out. <laughs> in some instances, these groups, AQAP, for example, yeah. or especially uh, Al-Qaeda's latest manifestation in Syria, you know, it's very difficult for standing armies in the region to confront. So there, you do have to have a military response. But again, this yeah. goes back to a decade ago, and we believe that every terrorism problem was amenable to a, to a military solution, and it's much more complex than Are we that. in an endless war? I would say we're more in a generational war, but Seems that doesn't have any end in sight, at least for the, <laughs> at least for the time being. Okay, well, that, yeah, that, that could be a long time. We'll, have, well, uh, we'll open it up for questions then. Yeah, hopefully there won't be a reason for a fourth edition. Well, I mean, it sounds time. like we're guaranteed so. one. Yeah. <laughs>
I think it's on. It's on? OK. Yeah. Uh, you've identified sanctuaries and safe havens as key to ter terrorism's viability moving forward, uh, kind of related to that. The U.S. Uh, military presence in the Middle East uh, since 9-11 has been enduring, probably enduring longer than anybody thought. Uh, moving forward, how key do you think U.S. military boots on the ground in a CT role will be to denying safe havens? Is it entirely necessary, not necessary at all, somewhere in between? Well, it's entirely necessary, but that's not to say that we should make a, make a practice out of invading and occupying countries ad infinitum, because that clearly hasn't worked. But that is to say that terrorism has to be addressed depending on the manifestation and depending on the threat that it poses, that sometimes there's, there's no alternative but to use military force to weaken the terrorist organizations, in essence, to break their backs and then make that environment more amenable to greater stability and to building up police forces and addressing the fundamental political or economic grievances that have given rise to terrorism. Are you surprised that we're in wars of various kind in, uh, in seven Muslim countries right now? That's sorry? Are you surprised that we're in wars of various kinds in seven Muslim countries right now? No, because of the spread of the aff affiliates and franchises and branches of the terrorist groups. To me, that makes perfect sense, and that's part of their strategy is to attempt to enervate and exhaust <clears throat> us through this prolonged war of attrition fought on multiple fronts. Make sure this gets on the record here. Um, hmm. So I think one of the things that uh, it seemed to me like a lot of people were kind of shocked about when ISIS came around was not just the safe haven, but the fact that they were controlling major population centers, that they had, in essence, established a state for themselves. Kind of a year later, we saw AQAP try the same thing in Yemen and El Mukella, and I'm, both of those have somewhat receded a little as military forces have been able to retake those towns. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on if you think moving forward, we'll see other affiliates attempting to take and hold and govern major population centers, and if that is kind of going to be a continuing paradigm for terrorist groups moving forward. I think, unfortunately, that was one of ISIS's huge innovations that sort of made it in fashion or in style to seize large chunks of territory and control populations. And of course, just this past July, the Al Qaeda, the latest Al Qaeda, the, well, the Al Qaeda variant, but the latest name that they use in Syria, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, seized control of the entirety of Idlib province, which is, of course, strategically situated along the border to uh, to, to Turkey. And that, I think, is dangerous, because that wasn't necessarily al-Qaeda's modus operandi in years past. But the development of AQAP and its, uh, I think, its rising power and presence in Yemen. Um, also, I think al-Qaeda feeling that ISIS stole a march on it by creating the caliphate and by establishing this rule that al-Qaeda has become more involved in, quote unquote, you know, that form of Salafi jihadi nation building than it ever had in the past. I mean, usually, you know, sort of subcontracted that out to some of its local minions, but themselves were just involved in, in terrorism or in operations. But even it's transitioning more into a quasi-governmental force, at least, at least in Syria and Yemen. But you know, ISIS had a sort of incoherent strategy, because when it was doing what you described in 2014, in, in the initial uh, in the spring and summer, it could have just stayed there and like, kept all this population under control. But then when it killed Jim Foley, started killing American aid workers, you know, um, attacking in Turkey, you know, suddenly it created it's sort of a Napoleon problem where you create right. a world of enemies who are all trying to, you know, basically, and it, you know. So the strategy was incoherent because if they stayed with the caliphate, so if al-Qaeda really learns from its mistakes, it actually might control Id Idlib and sort of say, we're not going to attack in the West because, like, why do we need that? That's I mean, that, would, that would be a, a winning strategy for the group. When, mm -hmm. I mean, that wouldn't be bad for the West, either. It would be very bad for the people of Idlib. Well, I think al-Qaeda has pursued that strategy, at yeah. least for the past four years, yeah. uh, that, it's, that it's deliberately laid low and hasn't wanted to provoke, uh, provoke a Western response, and very gleefully sees ISIS sort of absorbing all the heat and all the attention right now. But this goes, I mean, exactly back to what we were talking, what we discussed earlier, in the sense that, um, you know, terrorist groups overestimate their own power. They overestimate their own omniscience. Um, 
And invariably, if al-Qaeda's endpoint is not so dissimilar from ISIS, it's the resurrection of, of Muslim rule over territories that were once part of this empire, the recreation of the caliphate, the main dispute between al-Zawahiri and al-Baghdadi was on timing yeah. and sequencing. Um, eventually, I think, against their own interests. I mean, their obsession with Afghanistan, to my mind, is like you know part of their Achilles heel or part of the seeds they sow of their own defeat. Why do they want a landlocked country? But their cooperation with the Taliban and the creation of al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent is so focused on Afghanistan as well. So that they, my point is, like most terrorist groups, they will be able to control themselves, just like ISIS. And over time, that threat will turn to the West when they believe they're powerful is strong enough to resist any response. And to strike an optimistic note, it'll be just like a replay of 2001 and 2002 when they completely underestimate the response and the resolve of their opponents. In your book, I mean, you talk about the, the way, you know, there's been the anarchist wave and the sort of uh, socialist, I mean, the, the anti-colonial wave and the Marxist wave, and now we're in this mm -hmm. religious wave, and the religious wave, you know, begins in 1979, essentially right with the overthrow of the Ayatollah. I mean, we're already, the anarchist wave, the other, these other waves lasted, what, 30 or 40 right. years. We're already past that. Right. And so the interesting question is, like, how long will this wave go on? Because, I mean, I think, you know, typically they do tend to sort of sputter out because they don't achieve their goals, right. uh, you know, for the, all sorts of reasons. Yeah. But it seems that this wave isn't sputtering out. And I'm, I mean, my intuition is because, it, you know, if you, have, if you claim that God is on your side, uh, that's a pretty large claim. If you claim the Soviet Union is on, on, your, on your side, well, when the Soviet Union collapses, it's sort of a, you know, the, the deal is more or less done. So what is sustaining this uh, mm -hmm. wave so much longer than the other waves? Right. We actually talked about exactly this in class last night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and it was actually David Rappaport who came up with, yeah. the, with, the, with the wave yeah. ideas. And I think he was right in looking in a 19th and 20th century context that they lasted roughly 40 years. But just as you explained, he didn't reckon on the power of religion yeah. and a violence that is somehow divinely ordained, that is sanctioned by scripture and communicated by clerics as just a visceral and emotional power. And that, that was really the, one of the intellect. big themes of your first edition, right? right? I mean, like we're in a new phase. This, this is a religious way. This is going to be different. Right. And in fact, I was ahead of Rappaport. Rappaport still hadn't written about the fourth wave. And I said the fourth wave, or as just you described, it started in 1979, not only because of the Iranian revolution, that was the Shia side, but also the invasion of Afghanistan. Yeah. And of course, the siege of, of the Mecca. Grand Mosque in Mecca, which, which And the had peace a, deal with Sadat. So. Right, had a galvanizing impact on Wahhabism on Saudi, Saudi Arabia. So certainly religion. But also, I think, the role of social media and just the power of communications that's mm. been, become so powerful on a personal level or so powerful in an epigrammatic fashion that tweets from terrorist groups at 140 characters. I mean, look at Al-Shabaab, as I said earlier, is like the B or the C team of terrorism. And when they staged the attack on the Westgate Shopping Center in Nairobi, they were live tweeting about the assault, which gives, enhances the power of terrorism, the fear, uh, anxiety, but also the power of groups to project a global message. And, and their tweets were more reliable than what the Kenyan government That's, was saying, which may be a low bar. But I mean, it was the first time where you really saw a terrorist attack where the information was completely live that was right. coming from inside, maybe not necessarily the people doing the attack, but. Right. And this is kind of, it was really the beginning on. of this kind of merging with right. terrorism and, and the media. And I think that's a phenomena that we haven't quite come to terms with. And, that, and I would think just because of the communicative power is going to mean that this wave will last longer and be sustained yeah. at a great, far, far greater period of time than the previous ones. Any reasons for optimism then? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, going back to an earlier point, terrorists very rarely triumph. I mean, yeah. they, they, they're able to inflict great tragedies on their victims and on the nations that they target. Uh, but the flip side of that is that the value of liberal democratic states, I think, and not succumbing to the provocation strategy of terrorists that cause us to adopt very illiberal solutions to our security problems is exactly the strength of our resistance to them. I think the, the one reality, and I don't think this is pessimistic, pessimistic or, or optimistic, it's diagnostic, is that unlike previous eras, terrorism has become a, a, a fixture of international and domestic security in the 21st century, at least for the time being. Uh, 
And that's the big difference. I mean, it was always something that certainly occurred, but was more containable and had less, I would say, fewer consequences than it does, than it does today. I mean, countries didn't go to war over terrorism that often. If they did, they were wars that were short and sharp in duration, hmm. or maybe lasted a decade that are not dragging on now ad infinitum. Other questions? Um, has very strong fee freedom of speech and protection of the press laws. And in Europe they do too, but they also have um, different laws against like hate speech. And um, it seems like the ISIS message is more popular in Europe than has been in the US. And I was wondering if you could talk maybe a little bit um, about why there is this difference and why it's more popular there than it has been in the US, seeing as they're both liberal democratic right. states. Well, even now I think the ISIS brand is is very powerful, even with them losing territory. In fact, their messaging in recent months, it used to be, you know, come help us build a state. Now it's basically exact revenge for the destruction of the state. Now I think they still have a sufficient number of adherents, uh, as we see in Barcelona, for example, just last month. Well, I think this goes back to old arguments about, you know, generally speaking, why there's been less of an incidence in, of terrorism historically in the United States than, than in Europe. Uh, the United States is a country, despite what some people may say now, that was built by immigrants, that welcomed immigrants. And it, in the United States, it wasn't where you were from, but who you were and what you achieved. And I think it's very different from many of the societies in Europe where immigrants, uh, and especially from Muslim countries, have basically been in the lower socioeconomic rungs, have been discriminated against, or even when they are successful, such as in the United Kingdom, for example, where you know, uh, Omar Said Sheikh, who, who, who kidnapped and murdered uh, the Wall Street Journal reporter uh, Daniel Pearl, you know, had gone to the London School of Economics, uh, uh, you know, was a uh, you know, very talented student. Um, uh, uh, Omar Shar um, Khan, who was one of the suicide bombers in 2004, went to King's College London where he studied mathematics. So these were, were people that were quite successful, but nonetheless never felt a part of their societies. And you see this, this, this recurrent problem with first and se second generation immigrant communities. Uh, and that, I think, has been the enormous difference. Also, the homogeneity of the Muslim community in the United, the United States has, I think, facilitated an integration that, for instance, in Britain, where the vast majority of Muslims are from two countries, basically Pakistan and Bangladesh, and even from Pakistan, mostly from Kashmir, from one of the fault lines in what is seen as the struggle uh, between Islam and its enemies, has given rise to a much greater problem than we've seen in the United States. Uh, you know, the latest figures I've seen from MI5, the British Security Service, is that they have 3,500 active counter-terrorist investigations and another 20,000 cases that they're waiting to get around to, which is absolutely astonishing. I mean, there's, there's nothing like that in the United States, but of course, the number of foreign fighters that went from the United States to uh, Syria or Iraq is a much larger country than the United Kingdom is much smaller. I had a question going back to you mentioning safe havens as key. Um, I'm wondering about now the ability to train online or to pass information online and how that's making it easier to radicalize people who have never been to any of the conflict zones. Um, so if they're able to host their information online in encrypted apps, um, how, how do we combat this? Um, I know that's an issue the government's been grappling with, um, but are there any lessons that we've learned from um, fighting on the ground that maybe could be used in the cyber realm? You know, that's, that's a really good question because it touches on so many things that we've discussed um, uh, throughout the evening. Well, firstly, I'm an al-Zawahiri at Nights Under the Prophet's Banner, which was published in December 2001. Somehow when he was fleeing you know, Operation Enduring Freedom in the U.S. Uh, and coalition attacks in Afghanistan, he was able to write this treatise that was published in a London newspaper. And he, call, he basically called on lone wolves, you know, use that term, but called on people to stay in place, to use whatever weapons they could, you know, a knife, he mentioned, using a car to attack their enemies. But, you know, it was 
printed in a newspaper in London in Arabic and had very little resonance. And then we see, you know, 13, 14 years later, a Muhammad al-Adnani, the, the time the chief spokesperson for ISIS, using social media, using Twitter, um, Instagram, all, Facebook, all these platforms, is able to summon this, you know, this, this array of lone wolves throughout the world to answer the call to do ISIS's bidding in much the same way. And I think that underscores this really seismic impact that social media has had on facilitating terrorist recruitment and radicalization and operations. The problem as I see it is we're always reacting uh, to these phenomena. It's very difficult for us to get out ahead of it. I think it's also difficult for us, uh, especially given our freedoms and First Amendment rights, to often draw the line between what's our uncomfortable or extreme views and where that, that line crosses to people actually being encouraged or, or actually advocating the use of, of violence. But the one thing that has eluded me is somehow for years there's been all these algorithms on Facebook and on other media platforms that can identify child pornography, for example, and shut it down immediately. Why that hasn't been able to be applied, or until recently it hasn't been developed into the jihadi framework. And it's really only in response to the outcry from the United Kingdom, after the, after, particularly after the Manchester attacks uh, last May, um, that I think a lot of the social media companies are taking. I mean, they always took it seriously, and they always uh, were engaged. But I think that's been heightened by the fear of legislation. But you know, my argument would be Silicon Valley, or I mean, these types of technologies are on an 18-month cycle. So rather than you know. I mean, or in addition to countering the current modes of social media, governments need to be thinking about what's being developed over the next 18 months and what are terrorists going to harness and use in the future, and thinking about how to build in countermeasures right now. To my knowledge, I mean, there's, there's, there's some work being done, but the trouble is, unlike other elements of the war on terrorism, it's very difficult to measure effectiveness. There's no clear metrics, and this means that funding is very uneven. And the, although the importance is recognized, but the resourcing that's needed to really have an impact against these groups, I don't think has ever been there. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering what you might think about uh, the US, and in particular the Department of State and Department of Defense, um, funding more platforms like Tor and other ways for people uh, in different countries to access more clandestine parts of the internet uh, as it relates to terrorism, because on the one hand, it allows for people in repressed countries uh, to promote democracy, to um, you know, achieve their ends, but on the other hand, it can promote terrorism. Is there any way, do we think, that we can regulate this on a state level uh, to do one thing and not the other? And if not, is it worth attempting to shut down? Well, you know, shutting down Media outlets for terrorists is like you know the Dutch boy trying to plug figures, you know his fingers in the dike to stop the water level from rising, and I also have an aversion to governments becoming actively involved in cutting off sources of communication that have also a positive role as well. Um, I think we have to think better about countering the terrorist groups themselves, and that that's, you know that should be the highest priority. Uh, now that ISIS in its territory holding more conventional form has largely been rolled back in Iraq and Syria, what do you think the next phase will look like? And do you think that will be more difficult for the U.S. to achieve victory now that ISIS is maybe going more underground in those regions? Well, the victories won't be as obvious. That's, that's, that's one of the problems, is that the victories are demonstrable when you're taking back cities from ISIS and liberating populations and also literally decimating their ground forces. But you know, this again, I think, is part of the DNA of terrorism, is that terrorist groups don't survive unless they have this capacity for adaptation and adjustments to even the most consequential or effective countermeasures used against them. I mean, my argument would be, as we've discussed with Peter, is that um, ISIS has already put in place the means to facilitate, maybe not ensure, but certainly for, to facilitate its longevity. And this has been the cultivation of sanctuaries and safe havens or branches. The NCTC, a report that they issued 13 months ago, said that ISIS has a presence in 18 countries. 
it's sobering to think that at the start of coalition operations against ISIS in September 2014, they had a presence in seven countries. So this is exactly that subversive element that you're talking about, this underground presence. The second dimension of that is even now we know, even before the November 2015 attacks in Paris, ISIS had already created an external operations capability in Europe um, that I believe still functions. It's much more fractured and it's perhaps less of a well-oiled machine than it might have been in Paris and Brussels and other places, but it still exists. But what's worrisome to me is that the branches now are also developing that same sort of capability and obviously the Libyan branch, as much as ISIS is nearly destroyed in Libya right now. Unfortunately, Al-Qaeda is much more prominent there, but that's another story. And it's part of what sustains, unfortunately, this war on terrorism. But you know, certainly the Libyan branch had a pivotal role in the Manchester bombing of the Ariana Grande concert. And that, to me, was enormously chill chilling because I mean, Peter's right. We've known one another for so many years that I am an inveterate pessimist. But even in the depths of my cynicism or pessimism, when I was looking at the initial reports of that attack, I thought it just had to be a coincidence that with the British general election nine days away or 10 days away, that the attackers were just looking for some large public venue to attack and sort of to elbow themselves into the limelight in the, the days leading up to the, the election. So even in my abiding pessimism, I was absolutely horrified when it's being revealed that it was a deliberate, uh, that the target was deliberately selected because there'd be young women there and their parents. And you know, that shows why it's so important to you know, not become complacent and not, you know, not to ease up any of the efforts to eliminate this adversary. But it shows the determination and even resilience of ISIS to even up the ante by becoming even more lethal outside of you know, the tragedies they've inflicted upon the peoples of Iraq and Syria in recent years. Uh, Jim, first, thank you for tonight. It's been a great honor. You had mentioned, Dr. Hoffman, how the um, how terrorist organizations are very adaptable and how they're changing everything. And we've really seen uh, over the last uh, two decades or so where the traditional thinking of like how a terrorist organization operates is how Al-Qaeda was before 9-11 with a central organization and multiple cells. But we've seen, especially starting with Hezbollah and now with ISIS and somewhat to a lesser extent Hamas, these hybrid organizations. So my question is, are we really right now seeing what you could really describe as the death of the traditional terrorist organizational model? And if so, how would we really start, I guess, how would we really focus on being able to tackle these hybrid threats that have now become more prevalent? Well, I don't think we're seeing the death of, uh, of the traditional terrorist organization. As Peter and I were talking a decade ago, there were some who were saying that was the case. But what we are seeing is the constant evolution of terrorism. And that's, of course, one of the main themes and what, what drove me to write Inside Terrorism in the first place is that this is part of a continuum mm -hmm. where terrorism is constantly adapting and adjusting. And I mean, terrorism doesn't occur in a vacuum. It often reflects developments in society, whether it's the embrace of new technologies, whether it's the, the exploitation of new fissures or divisions within societies. I mean, terrorism you know, is, is not you know, is that something that, well, it basically occurs in a vacuum. So, no, there'll still be a place for the, you know, the, the canonical, the or traditional, stereotypical terrorist organization. But they'll aspire to grow and expand to be something more than that as Hezbollah has become, as ISIS for a short period of time became when it had its caliphate, as we discussed Al-Qaeda increasingly is becoming in places like uh, Yemen and in Syria. So, you know, that's the, and I think that's the enduring fascination of terrorism is there isn't one model of terrorism, which means, of course, there isn't one solution. That in its enormous complexity, you have to constantly evolve new solutions or new combinations of things. And what you can learn from the past is not to make a lot of the stupid mistakes that have been made before, mm -hmm. but to embrace different approaches and often hybrid approaches to countering this phenomenon. Hi, thank you for speaking. You mentioned that Al-Qaeda affiliates in particular have really been entrenching themselves in local conflicts, uh, particularly Syria or Yemen come to mind. Uh, 
Do you think then that a counterterrorism framework is the right lens through which to analyze this problem set, or should we consider applying like a counterinsurgency uh, strategy instead? Yeah, that's a very good question. I've, I mean, and that's hitting the nail on the head because you know, to me, counterterrorism is more tactical than strategic. It's addressing the imminent threat, whether by eliminating terrorist leaders, by arresting and putting people in jail, by destroying terrorist assets, training camps, and so on. Counterinsurgency, in my view, is much more uh, sophisticated in the sense that it aims for a strategic outcome. It's not only using kinetic force to defeat an enemy, but then reshaping that environment politically or economically or addressing the social grievances so that they don't regenerate themselves and they don't rise up again. And that's always been, you know, insurgency and counterinsurgency right now is about, you know, these are concepts that are completely shunned in, in Washington because of the, the connotation they have of being involved in endless nation building. But at the end of the day, that's really the only solution is looking at these struggles from a holistic perspective. And um, yeah, ex ex exactly, because you have to reshape the environment. Otherwise, you're going to have the recrudescence or the regeneration of the same threats that you fought before. And this is unfortunately exactly what we're seeing now with this new generation of Al-Qaeda with the emergence of very formidable and very threatening entities like ISIS. Uh, hi. Uh, this question might benefit from both your insights, actually. Uh, historically, as was discussed, the norm in terrorism is for, from suicide bombing to attrition, from counterterrorism, for ranks to be depleted, for the most part, and only a few leaders, say, to remain. And there's some historical examples, like Tito Fijo led the Colombian FARC for 40 years, Carlos the Jackal was all over the place. He even transitioned from communism to Islamism, incredibly. Um, today, in the present world, my question is, in addition to someone like Ayman al-Zawahiri, who has been there and has seen a lot in his lifetime, are there other specific individual terrorists that we might say uh, represent like a historical figure who's alive and active today, as opposed to the legions that are being killed in the Middle East every day? Yeah. Hmm. Right? I mean, he is probably, in my view, one of the single most, you know, dangerous terrorists in the world. I mean, someone who was trained in the Egyptian army and special operations units, uh, who was pivotal in the training of Mujahideen in the 1980s in Afghanistan, who had a planning role in the embassy bombings in 1998, who even from his e exile in Iran in 2003 was orchestrating or helping to orchestrate al-Qaeda's campaign in Saudi Arabia, and now is in Syria, minding al-Qaeda's interests there. I mean, that's not to say that killing Saif al adl will you know, put to rest al-Qaeda's ambitions in Syria, but when I think of you know, a Carlos-like figure or this you know, looming individual, um, Certainly of the old guard, he would take the prize. I would say of the new and up-and-coming guard, probably Hamza bin Laden. But for the simple reason that you know, ISIS styles itself as the true inheritors or the true uh, disciples of bin Laden or bin Ladenism and sees al-Zawahiri as a fraud as having taken the struggle off in a different direction. So you can imagine how important a figure like Hamza bin Laden, the heir apparent, is in any attempts to achieve some form of modus vivendi or reunification or strategic cooperation between the groups. And if you read this, Peter and I were just talking uh, before, before um, uh, this presentation about this great book, The Exile, by Kathy Scott Clark and Adrian Levy. And I thought one of the most important passages in the book is that Hamza bin Laden, as a young boy, you know, didn't want to leave his father's side in November 2000 and, and, and 2001, that he was going in exile with his mother to in safety of, uh, of, uh, of Iran. And he was, of all the bin Laden children, I mean, he was a young, a young boy at the time, was so dedicated to the struggle and wanted to f follow in his father's footsteps. And of course, was, was mentored by Saif al as well during that sojourn in, in, in Iran, and now is emerging as at least an increasingly prominent uh, mouthpiece for Al-Qaeda. Why don't we take one more question, because I know Peter has to run. I'm happy to stay behind and, and speak, answer any of your questions, but I know Peter needs to get going this evening. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, you spoke 
extensively about ISIS's successful use of social media as an information warfare platform. What do you see as their main vulnerabilities in this space? And from your position, what would a successful counterterrorism information warfare campaign look like? Hmm. Boy, that's a tough question, <laughs> especially for the last public one. Uh, you know, the, well, this goes to my skepticism to date. I'll, I'll answer it, I think, in a roundabout way, but hopefully that'll address exactly the core of your, your point. I mean, this, you know, if we could ever figure out why people become terrorists, then we'd have this one, but we're never gonna do that. And that was exactly one of the things that I remember when I first started studying terrorism at RAND uh, 36 years ago. I became acquainted with this massive four volume German study by psychologists and psychiatrists and sociologists and historians and political scientists that from a very finite sample, I mean, it was basically left-wing terrorists in Germany that were all relatively the same age, relatively from the same socioeconomic background, same religion, same race, same language that they grew up with. And the Germans were completely flummoxed at ever coming up for an explanation of why people became radicalized and became German terrorists. And there were only 36 hardcore members of the Red Army faction and maybe 17 or 20 members of the 2nd of June movement. I mean, we're talking about you know, 40,000 foreign fighters that gravitated to ISIS in Syria and Iraq. I mean, a, a vast or different space. So it's like Brian Jenkins, who was my first boss and one of my mentors, famously said, you know, we can look within man's, a man's soul, then we can figure out how to counter terrorism, hmm. prevent them from becoming terrorists. And it's almost like that, I think, with social media. It's because part of ISIS's effectiveness is personalizing the message, is from those that they recruited. They didn't have, like, the throwing out the fisherman's net like Al-Qaeda had on the internet. It wasn't a passive form of recruitment or of media engagement. It was often very specific and targeted where they got individuals from communities back home, from the same schools, from the same youth groups, from the same mosques, um, same family networks, same neighborhoods, basically to communicate with their brethren there and personalize the struggle and make it seem much more accessible. And this was, I think, just on a very practical sense, an enormous fulminant and an enormous attraction to people to join the struggle because it was something that their neighbors or friends or fellow students were doing. And this is something that actually Mark Sageman has, has, has mapped. I mean, the social networking dimension of terrorism and recruitment is so enormously uh, important. Now, how you counter that, especially that sort of personal message. Now, I mean, ISIS operated on a number of different levels. I mean, on the one hand, you know, to people that they knew were very devout, that may have came, come from very distinguished um, religious families, they targeted them with very theological messages that cited Quranic scripture or the Hadith. But then you have this entirely different recruitment method that reveled in ultraviolence. I mean, taking sex slaves, for example, blowing things up and shooting that, it, it, you know, appealed to and attracted an entirely different demographic. So how you can come up with a media strategy that covers that waterfront uh, and is as anticipatory as their own recruitment efforts were, you know, to me is enormously difficult. I think you know, it begins with the military power that dismantles the sanctuary and safe haven or the terrorist bases that become this physical source of attraction that you can actually travel to and join. But then once you, do, once you dismantle those and diminish the attraction of the terrorist group, that's when I think the social media and the messaging is so important in, at a different level in firstly laying bare the hollowness of their ideology and also the failure of them to create this utopia that they promised. Um, and that's where I think it could bear more fruit than the approach we have now, which is trying to stop people from going overseas, which in some cases has worked with enlisting clerics as you've written about. Uh, but you know, it's so difficult to achieve that on a systematic and I think cohesive and coherent basis. All right, well, I think uh, I can speak for all of you that uh, we have truly been enlightened tonight. Hmm. Peter, uh, thank you for uh, thank you, sir. bringing out the best of Bruce. <laughs> I, I think this, uh, this discussion what was truly enlightening, uh, somewhat uh, pessimistic, not enough optimism, uh, but, uh, but I think it's uh, a lot of food for thought. I think we're all gonna go out and read the third edition. Thank you.